Our speaker today, uh, uh, Vitaly Chernitsky, is a, a native of Odessa. Uh, he is new to KU. Uh, he uh, um, completed his PhD in comparative literature at the University of Pennsylvania, and has taught at Columbia University as well as Miami University of Ohio. Uh, and his interests include 20th uh, and 21st century literature and film, uh, particularly from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, but I looked over sort of the, uh, the list of his interests. Uh, and, it, and it really is a, a very comprehensive list. Uh, everything from, from literature and, and postmodernist uh, identity, also to uh, um, sort of uh, culture and globalization. Uh, and his book, uh, for which he, he won a, a best book in the fields of Ukrainian history, politics, language, literature, and culture, uh, is called Mapping uh, Post-Communist Cultures, Russia and Ukraine in the Context of, of Globalization. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll turn it over to Vitaly. All right, thank you so much, Mark. And uh, hello, everyone. I guess good afternoon since it's past 12 o'clock. And thank you so much for coming here. Uh, so I uh, would like uh, to use this opportunity to uh, hopefully introduce uh, you to some issues at stake when one talks about uh, Ukrainian cinema and uh, the role of cinema in the construction of modern Ukrainian nation and also hopefully have within this uh, context uh, speak about some broader implications not just for Ukraine but for the broader region that we study here at the Center for Russian East European and Eurasian Studies. So the, therefore, the title, Cinema in the Making of Modern Ukraine. Can you see the screen? Okay. All right, let's hope it works. So, first of all, cinema and national identity would be uh, my first issue. Uh, because, uh, especially here in the United States, with the dominance of Hollywood, uh, who is the elephant in the room when we talk about the global film industry, uh, Hollywood cinema is uh, very frequently discussed in terms of national cinema, even though you can say that films like Citizen Kane, they are, are actually very much important in the construction of American national cultural identity. So stepping back, uh, perhaps uh, rehearsing information that is familiar for uh, to, to many of you, but just making sure we're all on the same page. So, Benedict Anderson, a uh, famous historian teaching at Cornell University, in his famous book, Imagined Communities. So, nations thought of as imagined communities whose creation is fostered by media. This is one of the main uh, theses of his book. Uh, and he talks more about book printing, and this has been the standard. Uh, tenant and you know and news media from the print age, but new media, including film and radio and a lot of other um, new media that emerged in the 20th century, have been equally as important. We have a semi-apocryphal uh, statement by Lenin: "Isiak iskus dla nas najważniejszym dla kino." Well, the art cinema is the most important one of us, which is also important in the context of the study of the region that we uh, are looking at. Because from the very beginning, uh, after Bolshevik takeover in neighboring Russia, a lot of interest, a lot of funding, and a lot of attention was paid to this specific art form which one can argue at the time in the late 19-teens was still in its infancy. And stepping back, um, uh, talking about more Hollywood and global <coughs> film industry, still one can assert in many instances the existence of distinct national cinematic traditions. Uh, not to essentialize a national difference, but when one talks about a French film, or an Italian film, or a Japanese film, or an Indian film, one usually uh, comes uh, up with a certain vague set of associations which may or may not be confirmed by the actual film you're about to see. The film may play with them, may subvert them, may challenge them, but there are certain expectations of different national film traditions, 
that are often contrasted against global film industry. Again, epitomized by Hollywood as something supranational and globalizing, perhaps in the bad sort of you know, capitalist sort of McDonaldization of the world sense of globalization. But you know, one can dispute that because you, know, you can argue that sometimes Hollywood actually nurtures creative talent as well. However, if we look at where the theorizing of national cinema as a concept come from, it actually emerged, curiously enough, in the discussion of British cinema. Uh, the classic work is the work of uh, the British film historian Andrew Higson. Uh, his article, The Concept of National Cinema, which was published in the leading British film journal screen back in the fall of 1989, just as the Berlin Wall was about to come down. And later, in 1995, Oxford University Press published his book, Waving the Flag, Constructing the National Cinema in Britain. So we usually, just in the list I presented to you earlier, talked about French, Italian, Japanese, Polish, Czech, Hungarian cinema. We think about linguistic difference as one of the major defining factors. Here, talking about British cinema as national cinema, Hickson very much throws that out of the window. In other words, he says that national cinema is a much more problematic and vague but still useful concept. That's why I say theorizing, theorizing slash problematizing national cinema here. And a short quote from his article, which is sort of manifesto, of the study of national cinemas, parameters of a national cinema should be drawn at the side of consumption as much as the side of production of films, focusing on the activity of national audiences and the conditions under which they make sense of and use the film they watch. In other words, it's a two-way street. So the national film viewing habits of different places also inform, should inform our understanding what national cinemas are. It's not only on the production side, but it's also on the consumption side. Just like in literature, uh, literary studies, reception theory, and looking at you know, literary reception became one of the very important tenets of analysis of literature as a cultural and social institution. The same applies to cinema, and when we talk about its national features. And side by side with this, looking at nations and national histories, uh, I uh, would like to align myself here with uh, my good friend and colleague, Sergei Ikenshik, who teaches at the University of Victoria in Canada. And his, uh, specifically, a short quote from the introduction to his book, Ukraine, Birth of a Modern Nation, published by the same Oxford University Press in 2007. This study does not follow in the footsteps of either the historians of the Ukrainian nationality, ethnic group, or those who trace the past of the lands that are now Ukraine. Instead, I argue that the present-day multinational Ukrainian state owes its existence to the Ukrainian national project, an endeavor to build a modern Ukrainian nation and to provide it with a national homeland. It is important, however, not to see these processes as a pre-existing Ukrainian nationality acquiring the state structures to which it had long been entitled. Rather, a modern Ukrainian national identity itself was being shaped by the state structures, political events, and social processes unfolding in Eastern Europe during the last three centuries. Ukraine as a modern nation state did not come of age on its own, but was made by politicians, writers, and civic activists, as well as by warlords and bureaucrats in faraway imperial capitals. In other words, it's sometimes efforts at denying and erasing national identity, especially this year as we are marking the 150th anniversary of the notorious Valuyev Circular in the Russian Empire, which was the first event in the ban on the public use of the Ukrainian language, uh, especially in print media, it's sometimes a resistance against those pressures from outside that contribute to the formation of a national identity. So 
Uh, what are some of the key problems underlying uh, the situation when we talk about Ukrainian national identity and cinema? Ukraine is one of the nations that did not have a nation state of its own for most of its history. We can talk about Kiev and Rus and the Galician uh, Volinian Principality of the 13th century's precursor states. We can talk about the Cossack Republic of Zaporozhye and Sich of the 17th century as a precursor state. But modern Ukrainian na nation state is something that exists in fully independent form for a few years between 1917 and 1920 and then reemerges in 1991. The position of Ukraine as a republic uh, within the Soviet project is more complicated and more or less shortly. But just like, you know, I can talk about Ukrainian literature or Czech literature or uh, Hungarian literature when there were no uh, Czech Republic or Hungary or Ukraine, or for that matter, Poland, after the partition of the nations of the late 18th century, we can uh, talk about a national tradition with the, uh, outside the defined existing nation state. How then we do that without a narrow focus on ethnicity, with a, uh, without a critical problematization? Uh, it is a very precarious project, especially because Cinema is a technology-dependent art form. If a writer writes, or a painter paints, or a sculptor sculpts, or a composer composes, uh, she or he are usually doing it as a solitary activity. Cinema, by definition, is a collective art form. <coughs> they have to have a production crew, and it's different members of the production crew from uh, the person who goes click, to the director, to the actors, uh, to the recording engineers, to the makeup artists, to the caterers, they might have very different ideas of what their participation in any kind of national cultural project might be. It's also a financially dependent art form because it's so technologically invested, so we have here a complicated balance. But yes, I still argue that we can talk about a national cinema in these complex uh, situations. However, it should not be a dragnet sort of catch-all thing that any and all uh, cinematic activity on Ukrainian cinema, on Ukrainian territory, should automatically be considered Ukrainian cinema. Uh, just like, for example, Hollywood makes a lot of films in Eastern Europe, we would not call Red Heat a Russian film, and we would not call, uh, a now drawing a blank, there's a film set in Virginia during the Civil War, which was shot in Transylvania. We would not call that a Romanian film, even though you know the Romanian the Transylvanian Alps stood you know beautifully for the Appalachians. <laughs> so, not cinema. Cinema in Ukraine would be the broader thing. You think of Battleship Potemkin, which was filmed in Ukraine, but Eisenstein never quite was a conscious participant in the Ukrainian cinematic project. We are fortunate in that we have an excellent dissertation and as of next year an excellent book that actually tries to problematize these things in the context of cultural history. Joshua First, uh, who is now a, uh, an assistant professor of history and international studies at the University of Mississippi, in his dissertation on soon to be book Scenes of Belonging, uh, postulates a theory of what national cinemas were within the Soviet period. His main focus is on the so-called long 1960s, aka the Thaw era. But you know, in order to understand how national cinemas functioned during the Thaw era, we all should, should be aware of how they functioned during the high Stalinist era and before that in the <coughs> 1920s. So, very briefly, in the Stalin era, Josh argues, in a formation of the complex relationship between the nations that compose the USSR, and notice in the nations in quotation marks, and the centralized state in Moscow, authorities instructed loyal servants in the film industry to create scenes of national belonging that did not contradict the function of a highly centralized and Russian-dominated political and cultural system. 
the very project of Stalinist folkloric representation was to make non-Russians knowable within a particular mode of domesticating the Soviet periphery. A good example of that would be the uh, various soldiers in Mikhail Aureli's film, The Fall of Berlin, Padenia Berlina, because, of course, the main character is a Russian, but he has a Ukrainian pal, and he has a Georgian pal, and they have this domesticated, knowable otherness within the Soviet context. It's brilliantly sort of fitting this kind of paradigm. However, for as, again, as Josh argues, and I agree with him, for the semi-dissident poetic cinema filmmakers of the long 1960s, nationality was a question of self-discovery, exper an experiential rather than a rights-based discourse. So in that sense, it's different from a cinema of national liberation that arises in many third world contexts, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, uh, in the late 50s and 60s. The Soviet new national cinemas of Ukraine, of Georgia, of the Central Asian miracle of the 1960s, especially in Kyrgyzstan, is about this more experiential thing that we are trying to understand what we are about before yet claiming the rights. Even though, of course, <coughs> Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors was a film that inaugurated the uh, civil rights dissident movement, its opening scene in uh, Kyiv was the first major civil rights protest in Ukraine in 1965. We'll have more about that shortly. And yet another ingredient in the South. In the 1960s, the so-called national film, Nazionalne Kino in Russian, represented a subset of cinema production possibilities in the Union Republics rather than the totality of production in these nationally defined spaces. The national film functioned as a subgenre in terms of visual and narrative convention of how the industry categorized them and what critics and spectators expected from them. In other words, paradoxically in the Soviet Union in the 19, you know, from 50s, 60s, and 70s, we can talk about national cinema as a subgenre side by side with comedies, dramas, you know, adventure films, children's films. So it was a very strange and narrowed set of possibilities of what kind of cinematic production could be claimed as representing some sort of national identity and national cultural aspirations. So moving to Ukraine. Just uh, half a year after the discovery by the Lumiere brothers of their machine, uh, the first demonstration of their invention in Odessa, in, uh, which was the largest city in Ukraine at the time, took place. Of course, Ukrainians would tell you that Josip Timchenko, an engineer working at Odessa University, actually invented the same machine that the Lumiere brothers a few years earlier, and even presented it. However, because of Russian Empire's bureaucratic procedures, his invention did not get discovered and internationally appreciated. It's, uh, I do not want to say that this is one of those classic Soviet era discourses that everything was invented by people from precursor lands to the Soviet Union, from the airplane to the steam engine to the to radio to everything else, and not their Western peers. But curiously enough, in the case of cinema, it is a Ukrainian, not a Russian. Usually it's a Russian that invents all those other things in the Soviet mythology. Cinema is the only one where the Soviet mythology assigned that to a Ukrainian. However, that anecdote aside, by 1907, we have the beginning of regular new surreal filming in Ukraine, and occasional new surreal filming starts even earlier. And just a couple of years later, we have the beginning of the so-called art film, something that starts in France and then quickly spreads around the world. That is cinema, not just a, a show booth entertainment at a Coney Island-like place, but a something that is a serious uh, artistic endeavor with serious artistic aspirations. What it starts with, even though it's a silent genre, filmed theatrical monologues, so silent gesticulation with exaggerated, you know, 
uh, gestures and uh, facial ex you know, expression that you know, we often associate with silent uh, film. Then vaudevilles, and the first vaudeville, perhaps predictably enough, uh, is an adaptation of Gogol's uh, Night Before Christmas or Christmas Eve. Each at his dorm or much bigger at his dorm. And like elsewhere on the territory of the Russian Empire, and three quarters of Ukraine at the time was part of the Russian Empire, one quarter was in the Habsburg Empire, and in fact that was one of the major theaters of World War I. Paradoxically, when other arts and the, uh, the economy of the Russian Empire went into crisis for cinema, it was a major boom. One of the reasons why was earlier on there were a lot of imports coming into the Russian Empire of <coughs> French, German, Danish, American, etc. cinema. Uh, World War I disrupted those import channels, and there were already audiences that were hungry for cinema, so it actually spurred a more active film production. Continuing with prehistory, uh, in February 1917, uh, Russia becomes a republic. In March of 1917, uh, the Easter events of Kiev uh, start the journey towards Ukrainian independence. First, it's autonomy, then Chekhov and USL, the fourth universal of uh, Central Rada, proclaims full Ukrainian independence. However, the Rada is deposed in a coup by a more conservative <coughs> government, the second of the three independent Ukrainian governments of Pavel Skoropatsky. Skoropatsky's government, however, because it had relative peace and prosperity in the spring and summer of 1918, attracted a lot of talent from elsewhere uh, in the lands of the former Russian Empire where the Civil War was raging, and uh, they filmed a lot of newsreels, and at the same time, many film producers and directors who earlier were based in Petrograd and Moscow moved to Odessa and Yalta, which begins the era of the so-called Odessa and Yalta Hollywood. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Bolsheviks put enormous importance on cinema, and the specific genre that was very widespread in the early Bolshevik days uh, during the Civil War was Adivki, short agitational and propaganda films. And uh, when uh, in 1918, just before Dinikin troops push them back, a large chunk of Ukraine uh, comes under Bolshevik control. A lot of Agitki started being produced in Ukraine as well, including by some formerly anti-Bolshevik directors like Chardinian and more Chardinian shortly. Yet another major event of 1919 is actually the passing away of uh, the greatest silent film star of uh, pre-revolutionary Russian Empire, uh, Vera Khovodna, uh, in the Russian version of her name, Vera Khovodna, uh, died in Odessa during the Spanish flu epidemic in 1919, and her funeral was one of the few public demonstrations during the Civil War era which transcended political affiliations. The Russians and Ukrainians, whites and reds, uh, people who were Jewish and Christian, and uh, people who were religious and non-religious, they all came to her funeral. That was one of the most unprecedented uniting events during those times. But then the Civil War comes more or less to an end by the summer of 1920, and almost a year later than in the Russian Federation, in Ukraine, cinema is fully nationalized. And notice this one year difference. We think of the Soviet situation in the 1920s often as homogeneous. It was not. There were a lot of really important uh, national differences. Uh, in fact, in the film industries of Soviet republics of the 1920s were fully independent of each other. Often, they had stronger ties with film industries of other countries, such as Germany, than with Russia, and this was precisely the case of the Ukrainian film industry. There was a lot of dialogue with the German cinema in the 1920s during the Weimar period, and very little dialogue of, with uh, cinema happening in neighboring Russia, even though from 1922 onwards they were part of the same country, Soviet Union, and 
In the vague time of 20 to 22, there were technically two independent states, but their independence was of a questionable kind. In any case, Vufku, so Ukrainian Foto Kino Upravlinya, the only Ukrainian photo and cinema administration, was founded in 13 March of 1922, and it was the largest and technologically most advanced studio on the territory of the Soviet Union in the 1920s. It was bigger, more successful uh, than anything in Russia. Uh, and only in the early 30s, when the full centralization of Soviet film industry takes place, the Ukrainian cinematic strong independence of this institution gets eclipsed. So, uh, how do we deal with this Vufku period? Uh, it's a project and an institution of mm -hmm. national cinema. It's a project of a Soviet Republic that is Ukraine, not all participants in the Ukrainian film industry at the time were conscious proponents of Ukrainian national cinema as a project. Some, in fact, were emphatically resistant to the ideas, while others appeared indifferent to it. However, and as much as they worked within the institutional framework of Soviet era film industry in Ukraine, they and the products of their labor respond to the existence of this project in direct or indirect ways. And Vuku cinema was very little known and studied in the West, in part because of the Soviet centralization of channels of distribution things in later years. But now there is a major process of rediscovery happening. A lot of films are restored and are being shown at international film festivals. So the Vuku years are often seen by specialists of the golden age of Ukrainian cinema. It is very actively cooperating with film cinemas of Europe. And very often they poached, stole, headhunted talent from other places. For instance, Josef Rona, who was a very prominent uh, German cameraman, came to work at Bufku, and most famously, Ziga Virtov, one of the greatest innovative directors of Soviet cinema, quarreled with everyone in Russia, and Bufku was very happy to take him in 1928, and in fact, he made his best, most lasting work in Ukraine. The main center of cinematic production in Ukraine in the 1920s was the Odessa Film Factory. It was uh, based on the territory where several uh, private film studios existed before the revolution, but there was also an active boom of development. Um, let's see. This is a 1920s building of the film developing facilities. Unfortunately, Odessa Studios is falling on a hard time, so you see it's rather overgrown, the garden. But there is a wonderful and enthusiastic uh, director of the studio museum, and the museum is well worth a visit. And there is a corner from the museum there. Some early, notable early directors, you would notice that the names are Russian. Petro or Pyotr Chardinian, uh, active in Russian film industry since 1909, moves to Odessa in 1918, immigrates to the West 2023, returns to Soviet Ukraine. And this is when we talk about national is not ethnic. Chardinian becomes a very serious patriot of the new multi-ethnic, multicultural Soviet Ukraine. And his films like Ukrasia, Tarastre Silo, uh, are among the foundational works of Ukrainian cinema of the 1920s. Ukrasi, in fact, was uh, screened in Paris at the Art Deco ex uh, uh, exhibition, Exposition Internationale des Arts Decoratifs, in 1925, and uh, won a prize there. Chardinian was uh, not liked by Stalinist authorities, so in 1932 he was removed from filmmaking, and by then he was quite ill with cancer, and he passed away two years later, but he passed away without any proper respects. Uh, Volodymyr Vladimir Gardin uh, also is one of the very important figures in early Ukrainian film history, but he actually jumped ship and went to Leningrad instead. But in the early days, he is the most, one of the most important figures too. And it attracted a lot of great talent from other art forms. Les Kurbas, Ukraine's greatest theater director, a figure of the same stature as Sievolod Mirkhoi, the Bertolt Brecht, who was shot in the Slovki camps in 1937, 
Corbus was actively working in the film industry and actually was able to find some documents about Corbus in Odessa in the 1920s in the Odessa Regional Archive. Vasil Krychevsky, one of the greatest uh, Ukrainian architects of the National Revival architecture style and also a prominent painter, uh, died in immigration in Venezuela, in Caracas. Uh, but in the 1920s, early 30s, worked very actively in Ukrainian film industry as a set designer, including with Dozhenko. Yuri Yanovsky, a neo-romantic prominent prose writer, uh, was very actively working in Vufku and actually described it in his futurist novel Meister Korobya, Master of the Ship, which is uh, written in the form of memoirs from the 1970s of the character named Tomaki, Tavarish Meister Kina, comrade master of cinema, who is looking back at the great glory days of when they were all young and enthusiastic in the 1920s. And also a book of essays predictably titled Hollywood and the Hollywood and the Shorts of the Black Sea. And last but not least, Mikola Bajan, uh, one of leading Ukrainian modernist poets. Few people realize that he actually was the editor of the journal Kino, which was one of the leading film and film theory journals published in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, early 30s, and he too contributed film scripts and criticism. In addition to Odessa, they started building new facilities from scratch. <coughs> the Odessa facility was based on the pre-revolutionary film uh, facilities, a new state of the art film factories, they were called, film studio, was built in Kyiv in 1926-28, they received the main pavilion number one under construction. It is still very much in operation, and it's the largest enclosed set pavilion on the territory of the former Soviet Union. Can rival those in Hollywood. And <coughs> they wanted to build something on Hollywood scale. And uh, the Kyiv Film Studio also have a wonderful museum that looks at the history of the place and a lot of things that are available there. But, of course, <laughs> if we talk about Ukrainian cinema, there is one name that is inescapable, and that's the name of Oleksandr Dovzhenko. I was very happy when I found this visual. <laughs> so Oleksandr Dovzhenko is the defining figure of Ukrainian cinema. And notice that he is, you know, this very enigmatic person. This is one of his best known portraits, uh, photos of the 1920s. He's looking to the side. His self-portrait, notice he was also a graphic artist. He does not fully look at you. So Davzhenko is an enigma and a very interesting enigma at that. I'm not going to go too deeply into his biography, but it's very unusual. Uh, and it's actually self-constructed later mythology that allowed him to survive during the Stalinist period. Very complex trajectory of transformation. There is a very good book published by the British Film Institute, uh, written by George Lieber, who is a professor at the University of Alabama, if I remember correctly. Uh, anyway, British Film Institute 2002, George Lieber, L-I-B-E-R. Dovzhenko. Uh, with the son of a poor peasant family, his parents were illiterate. His grandpa, though, could read. And uh, as a child of a peasant family, he got educated in a school teacher's seminary, and he was sent to western Ukraine, to Volhynia, for to Russify the lands, the Abusinia Krai. And he was a very patriotic Russian person, you know, he and his school children threw flowers under the feet of soldiers marching to the Eastern Front in August 1914. His views changed very quickly. During the wars of independence, he fought for Ukrainian independence on non-Bolshevik Ukrainian nationalist side. But in 1920, he conveniently switched side to a nationally minded Ukrainian Communist Party, Borodbisti, which were later admitted into the Bolshevik Party. Nothing has to do with cinema. In 21-23, he's first in Warsaw, then in Berlin, as a Soviet revolutionary diplomat. And Soviet revolutionary diplomacy, of course, was supposed to foster world revolution. It was not about you know, diplomacy in our normal understanding. Suddenly, he is allowed to quit his diplomatic activities, and he is in 
Germany as an art student for a year. But his visa runs out, he has to come back to Soviet Ukraine in 1923 to renew his visa, and they did not let him back out. So he finds for himself another incarnation, he becomes newspaper cartoonist uh, for Ukraine's main, one of Ukraine's main newspapers, Visti Vutsavaka, and also film poster design. At the time, he's just completely, you know, amateur, sort of you know, interested in cinema, but doesn't know much about it. And that famous mythological event in his biography, 1926, age 32, he has a midlife crisis, early midlife crisis, decides to totally reevaluate his decisions, abandons his poor wife, takes a train from Kharkiv to Odessa, comes out and says, I stood like a naked man uh, in a new world, you know, sort of rebirth of you know, Adam, so to speak, and within two years becomes Ukraine's leading film director. So a very unusual story. So if we look at Dovzhenko's films, there are several canonical works. Zvenihora from 1928 is the first of his silence that received major recognition and attention. And it's an incredibly Baroque and complex work. There's multiple intertwining plot lines. It jumps back from uh, Slavic prehistory to um, Cossack age to modern days, but it was so wonderfully crazy in its brokenness that actually it was appreciated by major film uh, producers, uh, in, both in Russia and elsewhere, so it became a ticket for him for serious filmmaking. His next film, Arsenal, is a powerful, I mean, I'm sorry you cannot see the visuals very well here, uh, expressionist style film, uh, which actually deals, starts with World War I, and then the events of the uh, Revolutionary War in 1918 in Ukraine, where he rewrites history in pro-Bolshevik ways. Famously, at the end, Timish stands there, I am a Ukrainian worker, and bullets of the white, of the whites cannot pierce his. So he becomes the superhero kind of character. What is very often forgotten when this film is studied and it's known and studied in the West, that the Mish specifically is, doesn't say I'm a worker, he doesn't say I'm a Bolshevik, he says I'm a Ukrainian worker. So for Dovzhenko, the national project remains crucially important. He's the only one of the major Soviet biggies, the major film directors of the 1920s, who comes not from urban middle class background and who's very emphatic about his national difference. And of course, probably his best-known film, Earth, uh, which now exists in a beautiful new restoration with a beautiful new soundtrack that I hope to be bringing to campus shortly. Uh, uh, this is a film that is the crowning achievement of the Vremko as a work of poetic cinema, a very complex work where the logic of the aesthetics actually goes counter to the logic of ideology. The superficial narrative follows the Soviet party line, and the static perspective goes completely against it. So we, as a result, can see how aesthetic innovation can be a politically subversive project. <clears throat> of course, this did not make things easy for Dovzhenko, and his probably last great film is Ivan, his first sound film. He already there uh, makes concessions to Stalin's pressures, but just like in the West, the early talkies were often very experimental and innovative, and before the code arrives in Hollywood, you see a lot more experimentation happening. The same thing is happening in a Soviet film industry, and Dovzhenko is not an exception. Uh, Lilia Kaganovsky, who teaches at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, is now writing a brilliant book. I read a few chapters, a new chapter on Ivan, on early Soviet talkies, so watch out for that. We're soon going to have a really excellent book on the subject. If we look at Ziga Vyrdov in Ukraine, he arrives to make the film Odenatsity, the 11th, in 1928, and his most famous work, Ludinovsky Naparatom, Chiodikovsky Naparatom, Man with a Movie Camera, even though it was partly filmed in Moscow, it was produced in Vovku, you can see a lot of signs in Ukrainian in the film, it is entirely a product of Ukrainian 
film industry, something that people who admire Vyartov internationally often forget, and there's a cottage industry of Vyartov scholarship in the West. None of those people has read any of the publications on Vyartov or by Vyartov in Ukraine in the 1920s. So I have a subversive project in the planning with some of my Ukrainian colleagues <laughs> to correct that. And Vyartov's first sound films, you see here a poster Ukrainian, Enthusiasm, Symphonia Donbasu, is an experimental sound film. There is no spoken dialogue. It's like an hour-long music video, but instead of music, we have production noises, various natural sounds. So it is, in fact, a visual and sound poem. And just to say the mass audiences do not appreciate it, and this is the last <laughs> film that Vyartov was made in Ukraine. Both he and Dovzhenko were actually hounded out of the Ukrainian film industry. And uh, what happened in the film industry in particular, the change of the early 30s is so drastic because the arrival of Stalinism and the imposition of socialist realism coincides with the transition to sound. And when we're talking about national difference, especially in the Soviet context, the question of language choice becomes very, very important. Dovzhenko's, I mean, Vyartov sidesteps it in enthusiasm because it's all noise. There's no spoken dialogue. Dovzhenko and Ivan makes a Soviet film, but entirely in Ukrainian. No dubbing, no subtitle, which for audiences and for party viewership in Moscow was sometimes problematic. So what happens with the centralization of the industry, there's a steady move towards the aesthetics of socialist realism and also towards films in Russia. However, there are exceptions. Ivan Kabaleridze, a very interesting exception. He was an avant-garde sculptor who decided to try his hand at film directing, uh, son of a Georgian father and a Ukrainian mother. And in the 30s, he made some of the best Ukrainian films, Kulygivshchina, about a peasant uprising, Prometei, uh, based on Tarasochenko's poem Kafkaz, which is an early 19th century work of anti-colonial solidarity. And he directed the first Ukrainian language musical film, an opera, an adaptation of the famous Ukrainian opera by Mikola Lysenko, based on the play by uh, Ivan Kuverevsky, the founder of modern vernacular Ukrainian literature. Notably, Kavaridza was not allowed to work in the film industry from 41 until 57. He did return to filmmaking in the late 50s, early 60s. But what dominated Ukrainian cinematic production in the 1930s? The same question in Ukraine in the 1930s. Russian language call collective farm musicals by Ivan Puyev. Bagate Nivesta i Traktoristi. Ivan Puyev was Grigory Alexandrov's big rival. So Alexandrov's uh, musical comedies are urban musical comedies. Even Volga Volga starts in a small town, not in a village. Puyev claims collective farm musicals and somehow the idea of happy peasant life, even though Ukraine has just gone through all the more, the terror famine in mass Soviet society by parties' decrees has to be associated with Ukraine. And therefore, we have him and his uh, wife, uh, Ladinina, who is the star, just like Ivo was the star for uh, Grigory Alexandrov in these films. On the eve of the Nazi invasion, however, Ukrainian uh, national identity is mobilized, but for Soviet purposes. Dovzhenko is specifically summoned by Stalin to make a Ukrainian Chepai, that is Ukrainian answer to Chepai, which was one of the first really successful Soviet sound films. And it's a complete mythological rewriting of the events of the Civil War or the Revo Revolutionary Wars of Independence of 1917-1920s. The filming took five years, in part because during the filming, many of the consultants for the film, which were Soviet army officers, were arrested and shot. Uh, so it was done in the midst of Soviet terror. The film is of questionable quality, but it still is an important contribution to Ukrainian film history. And Ihor Savchenko, who is another prominent name, is from Bogdan Khmelnytsky released just before a Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, full of anti-Polish hatred, which <coughs> after the Soviet Union participated in second partition of you know, Poland, you know, 
second, meaning the, the new partition of Poland at the start of the outbreak of World War II, anti-Polish hatred was a very convenient feeling to exploit by Soviet ideological authorities. During the war, like elsewhere, uh, there was uh, some reprieve, the early uh, wartime documentaries, Dovzhenko switches to making documentary films are actually really interesting. But in 1943, Dovzhenko is actually summoned to Stalin and his next project is banned. And Dovzhenko becomes a marked man. So we usually think of uh, World War II as a time when there is a serious relaxation of Soviet censorship. It was not always the case. Sometimes Soviet censorship was just as severe. Uh, one of the most interesting works, however, of the time is uh, Rainbow by Mark Danskoy. is one of the best-known Soviet films of that time, which is set in a Ukrainian village, made by the Kiev studio in evacuation in Ashkabad, but starring major Ukrainian film talent, and one of the most classic you know, Ukrainian works of the time. This is Nina Alisava, whom you will see in Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, in a completely different thing. This is notably as you can figure out, these are two sisters. She is a guerrilla fighter and she is a Nazi collaborator. Hmm. We are almost out of time, so I'm just going to speed up. Uh, 45 through 60s is a lost period. Ukrainian cinema becomes uh, synonymous with bad cinema because very, very few films of good quality are made. Dovzhenko dies in Moscow. He is not allowed to come back. He is not wanted by Ukraine as soon as he is conveniently dead. He is canonized a national genius. Streets are named after him. Uh, the film studios were named after him. Riverboats are named after him, etc. But only after he's safely dead. <laughs> and Thor cinema, uh, desalinization arrives through Russian language films made at the Odessa studio by young directors. And the first one of them is. This Nana Zarechny Ulitsa, Springtime on Zarechny or Zarechny Street, which was filmed in Odessa and Zaporizhia by two young directors, Felix Mironer and Marian Hutseev. And Hutseev, of course, is one of the great names of Soviet film industry from that era to this day. And if you are following the news about what is happening to the Russian film industry now, Hutseev is the part of anti Nikita Mikhalkov faction of the filmmakers. In fact, the head. Faction, faction of the Filmmakers Union. There are, however, other works. There is the recapture of popular attention with Zadvoma Zaitsyami, Ch Chasing After Two Hairs, a really popular comedy from 1961, set in Kiev cir circa 1900. And for the longest time, the film was only available in the Russian language version, but recently, the original Ukrainian language version of the soundtrack was discovered, released, so we now know it, how it mysteriously vanished in the 1970s, nobody knows, but it has unvanished, and so it can now be appreciated in its original form. But the film we watched this Friday is the central work of Ukrainian cinema of the 1960s. And uh, it's also a major break with Soviet things. I, as I see here the quote from David Borbo and Christine Thompson, Shadows with its flurry of hysterically modernist techniques is a representative of not of thought cinema in the USSR, but of 1960s international art cinema. Unfortunately, this new Ukrainian poetic cinema, of which this film, A Stone Cross by Leonid Osika, is the other most important work, and here's another important film from Pavel Hramatev, was destroyed. If Georgia, which was another major center of poetic cinema, was able to resist, in Ukraine it was completely destroyed. Parajanov was arrested, uh, as were many other intellectuals, and most other film directors were scared into conformity and of making really horrible, mediocre films, most of them in Russia. So new uh, changes arrive in Ukraine with the trauma of Chernobyl. And uh, Perestroika arrives in Ukraine actually later than elsewhere in the Soviet Union. So the new interesting films only start happening in the early 90s, 1990, 1991, 1992. These are Rospad by Mikhail Bielikov, uh, Lebedin Olozor by Yuri Lenko, based on Parajanov's script. Uh, Hovo 33 by Oles Yanchuk, the first film about the terror famine. 
And uh, Kiss and the Hobbit, Oxygen Starvation, is a film about brutality and abuse in the Soviet army by Andriy Donchin. Uh, the 1990s period is known as the hidden cinema because of severe economic crisis. The economic crisis in Ukraine was even worse than in Russia. Very few films were produced, mostly with foreign support. But there is emergence of low-budget independent cinema. A major figure from the 1960s, Kira Muratova, who was not allowed to make films in the 70s, first half of the 80s, was able to uh, triumphantly come back and make a lot of really interesting and very challenging work, and she is still active. And then another very interesting phenomenon, sorry, is the so-called Svema effect. Ukraine, uh, in the town of Shostka, uh, near Sumy, was the place where all the Soviet film stock was produced. The factory in the early 90s went bankrupt and collapsed, but it had a lot of unprocessed film stock. So, which it has been long past its expiration date. So the film was really unpredictable in its qualities. However, graduating film school students needed to do their graduation projects on something. And they actually started exploring this bad Soviet expired film stock for creative purposes. And they created a few brilliant shorts, uh, which actually have received major international recognition. Mm -hmm. Yet another very important phenomenon to emerge is New Ukrainian animation, especially the claymation cartoons of Stepan Koval. So the 2000s, we have a tentative rebirth. As I said, here are the two best known short films. Ukraine won two Palm Doors uh, in the short uh, film category uh, Khan in 2005 and 2011. Uh, since 2003, there have been attempts to be entered into Oscar consideration. There are very interesting foreign co-productions like Ogniem and Mietzschem with Fire and Sword by Jerzy Hoffman, a Polish film director, but with very strong attention to Ukrainian sensibilities. Uh, wonderful documentary film director Sergei Bukowski, who has worked both on Holodomor and the memory of World War II and also the Holocaust. Actually, he was see Steven Spielberg uh, produced the uh, Bukowski Holocaust film, Spell Your Name, which is very, very good. Alexander Shapira he does Russian language experimental cinema. A little too experimental for my taste, but some people like it a lot. Uh, if you would like to know more, I direct you to Kino Kultura, which is a wonderful online journal. I had the privilege and the honor to just edit the special issue on Ukrainian cinema where you can find this URL, or you can just go to the basic website of Kino Kultura. And coming back to Muratova, that has been a major conundrum. Muratova is half Russian, half Romanian. She was born in Romania in the 1930s, came to the Soviet Union as a student in the 1950s, married a Ukrainian man, and moved to Ukraine in the 1960s. Uh, she's lived in Odessa ever since. And her, and her films were made in Russian, and because of that, and because she did not have a strong Ukrainian national identification, even though she's the best known woman filmmaker from the former Soviet Union, and there have been multiple books written about her in many languages, the question of whether she really belongs to Ukrainian cinema has often been raised. And Muratova herself has often evaded this film. But her penultimate film, Melodia de Sharmanke, a melody for barrel organ, a tune for barrel organ, which won multiple prizes, is her most Ukrainian work yet. So actually, 17 years into Ukrainian independence, Muratova decides to embrace this multicultural, multi-ethnic Ukrainian project in a more forthright fashion. And in this, you see here a Production shooting episode here is the director herself. There's a Kolyadnik, a Christmas carolers in traditional Ukrainian clothes on a commuter train, which is a crucial part of the opening scene of the film. The film, unfortunately, is not yet available on DVD with English subtitles, which to me is a great shame because I think it may be her best work. We also have the first national blockbuster, Firecrosser, Dr. Prashok Kris Bohoy, 
that based on a true story of a Soviet fighter pilot who is downed by the Nazis, taken by the Soviets to Colima, escapes from Colima, believe it or not, across into Alaska and Canada, and becomes the chief of a Native American tribe. <laughs> <laughs> true story. True story. And based on that true story, we have the film, the Operation of Baloon, Firecrosser, which was the first conscious attempt to make a new Ukrainian national blockbuster. But my question is where to next? It's very much an open question. This is the it's still from the film Mamai, which is Ukraine's first entry into the Oscars of 2003. This film is based on Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar legends, and it blends Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar dialogue and visuals. And to me, it's a wonderful example because we usually think of the Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars in the Cossack age as two warring factions. The fact that this film brings them together and unites them as one, I think, is a very hopeful message for a new Ukrainian multi-ethnic, multicultural, and creatively innovative cinema. So I hope there will be more good films like this to come. Thank you so much for your patience and your attention.